Joining us now is the director of the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University, where he is also serving as a professor of political science. Dave Dulio joins us once again on the Megacast. Dave, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure, Tyler. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. So uh, just recently we had the county conventions and then the statewide convention for nominees uh, for the Republican Party for, for uh, governor here in the state of Michigan, other positions as well, such as Secretary of State, Attorney General, uh, and more. Uh, and, and it's very similar, that uh, statewide convention, very similar to what we would see on the national stage around the uh, presidential elections. But there are specific differences and there is a certain process that's undergone in each party in the state of Michigan. So can you give us a review of the process that the Republicans went through to choose their uh, their, their preferred candidates, particularly for attorney general and secretary of state, but also to discuss their uh, their primary candidates for the gubernatorial election. Sure, uh, you know Michigan has uh, what we can maybe say is a unique system of uh, selecting candidates for statewide office. And the, the first point I would make is that um, some candidates are chosen by primary, and other candidates are chosen by convention and uh, when we're talking about a, a year like 2022 when we have a gubernatorial race secretary of state race uh attorney general race supreme court offices regents uh for u of m msu and wayne state uh we've got um candidates like attorney general secretary of state supreme court and uh, those uh, regents or, or board of governors, whatever they're called at those different institutions, those are chosen at convention. And the gubernatorial candidate, as well as uh, other, other um, offices, U.S. House of Representatives, State House, State Senate, uh, are, will be chosen in August during a primary election. Uh, I would say another thing about the um, two more points about the the process that makes it unique um one is the the state convention that was held last weekend on the republican side uh was technically not the nominating convention it was an endorsement convention there will be another meeting uh later in the summer that uh, formal nominations of these folks will be made and adopted um the other point the last point i would make and it gets us a bit of far afield here but um it's worth noting uh, we will elect Supreme Court justices in Michigan. We have for, for years and years and years. Uh, those uh, offices on the ballot in November are nonpartisan, but candidates only get on the ballot through a partisan process. Uh, Republicans will nominate uh, folks to be on the ballot for Supreme Court, uh, and they did, and um, and Democrats will do the same. So it, it is a it is a, a hodgepodge of, of maybe ways of, of uh, candidates getting on the general election ballot here in Michigan. And, and we've seen such contentiousness between these two parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, at the state level especially, going into this election, but that's kind of just a microcosm of the national contention that is between these two parties, uh, especially in the wake of the 2020 election, where the Republican Party questions the validity of that election, which is entirely unfounded and has been investigated 11,000 different ways, left, right, up, upwards, backwards, upside down, and every other direction you can think of. And then the Democratic Party continues to, of course, go after Donald Trump and go after those that are in his camp, which is now dominating the Republican Party. We look at the uh, endorsement, now, the endorsement conventions from this past weekend, and Trump-backed can candidates were pretty re uh, resoundingly nominated for or endorsed for these positions. You look at close races and you look at races in the attorney general and secretary of state's positions, particularly uh, attorney general Matthew DiPerno, who won 54 percent of the party vote on Saturday. He has been very outspoken about his opposition to the results of, of the 2020 election and his belief. He, I mean, he's filed lawsuits in the past and in, in results to that. And so it brings me to think about these elections. And again, the cliche comes up the most important election of our lifetime and it is so because every election has implications for the next one at this moment in time how crucial in the republican party do they see this upcoming election in the state of michigan for these critical positions especially governor attorney general secretary of state and even down the line in the supreme court for their future in 2024 
and then vice versa for the Democrats, how important is it to, for them to either, at the very least, maintain their current position in the state of Michigan and even nationally, but even more importantly for them, not give up any of that position to the Republican Party that supports Donald Trump? Yeah, you know, I think, Tyler, the, the, the next election is always the most important one. And, and that's, you know, it gets back to the fundamental goal of a political party, right, which is to win and then maintain control of governmental power. Uh, and, and because that's the only way that a, a political party and its, its candidates who turn into elected public officials uh, can implement the policy alternatives that they prefer, right? So uh, Democrats want to win in November so that they can keep hold of power in Washington, D.C. Uh, Republicans want to win in November to keep control of the Michigan legislature, right? And, um, and it's so, so it's always about the next election and therefore about the next governing period. I'm joined by Dave Dulio, professor of political science at Oakland University and also the director of its Center for Civic Engagement, joining us on the megacast on, on this edition of the program. And, and so these Trump-backed candidates have been endorsed by the Republican Party. They're presumably going to get those nominations should something not go uh, very wrong in the next coming months. But then we think about the analysis of the electorate in the state of Michigan and really nationally as well, because for the Republicans, the benefit of it being of these elections occurring in 2022 in the su in the summer for the primaries and in, in November for the general election is we're two almost three years removed from January 6th. It's it's been a long time since since that day has that harrowing day and that harrowing incident has been uh, ha has has been fresh in our minds. It's given time and time has started to heal parts of those wounds in some in some cases. On the other hand. Two years, two and a half years, three years is not a very long time. Uh, it's not a very long time politically either, and that's still very much front of mind, especially because Donald Trump's not in office, but hi but him and his politics are still very much defining the Republican Party. How much of a factor do you believe that the results of the 2020 election, but more importantly, the incident? on January 6th that occurred in the wake of the 2020 election may have an impact on the Republican Party's viability in these Michigan elections and even uh, nationally in other elections. Well, I think in terms of January 6th, you see the, the uh, U.S. House of Representatives uh, special committee that's investigating January 6th continue to do its work. Uh, and I would imagine that that's going to be timed up quite nicely uh, with the fall elections. Um, you know that, and that's the, the the prerogative of the of the Democrats, right? That they're in control in control of of the U.S. House. Uh, Nancy Pelosi's Speaker, uh, she can time that out just uh, just perfectly for them. So I think you'll see Democrats focus on that. I think uh, Republicans like uh, Mr. DiPerno and Ms. Caramo uh, will talk about 2020. Uh, I think there are other Republicans who want to move move on uh, and and talk about anything but 2020. Um, I think that the the uh, issue of relitigating the presidential election from a couple of years ago plays pretty well with some parts of the Republican base. Other parts it doesn't, and I, I I'm uh, I don't have any data for you, but but my hunch is that. Uh, it, it doesn't play very well with, with voters that Republicans need to win statewide in Michigan. Independent voters, moderate voters, persuadable voters, whatever we want to call them. Uh, those folks uh, are looking forward, not backwards. And so with that being the case, you look at the moderates, you look at the independents that maybe leaned Republican, certainly the independents that maybe leaned Republican in previous elections or tend to be more conservative politically. And you look at the moderates who are Republicans, who, who are more conservative and are not Trump Republicans necessarily. Do the Democrats have a, viab have a viable potential of picking up those votes in these upcoming elections? Because as much as we talk about the moderate Republicans being uh, being averse to voting for Trump-backed candidates or candidates that have Trump-related politics uh, in their arsenal, how reluctant or unreluctant are they going to be to vote for Democrats that may also be up for these positions in this election? And being that they're in that middle ground, 
are they more likely to go with their Republican candidates because of the conservative politics and take that risk, or do the Democrats have a viable chance? And how do they strategize for that to try to pick up those voters? Because those voters presumably will be the difference in this election. Well, you know, I think uh, I would say two things about that. One, uh, we've got some historical uh, data to, to fall back on, right? Where in 2016, you know, in a place like Oakland County, uh, you had a number of uh, folks vote for Trump, uh, whether that's because they liked Trump or didn't like Hillary Clinton is uh, is not the point, right? They, they cast their ballot for Trump. Uh, and then in 2018, they either changed and voted for candidates like Gretchen Whitmer, uh, uh, Secretary of State Benson, Attorney General Nessel, right? They, they, they voted for those candidates or they didn't show up, right? So, so that's the real sort of trick in midterm elections is uh, the, the surge and decline from presidential to uh, midterm year turnout. So right, Democrats, uh, can get those persuadable voters. So can Republicans, but you know they need to come at those folks with um, uh, with the right message, with one that is that resonates with one, with them, one it, that is convincing, one that that speaks to issues that they care about. And uh, you know the other the other factor is again turnout, right? And right now, uh, many Republicans are energized, and I think it, that it would be I'd be hard pressed to say that Democrats are an are at an advantage in terms of enthusiasm for 2022. Um, I think Republicans have an advantage there, whether or not um, they will come out and and cast votes for uh, candidates like Mr. DePerno and, and Ms. Caramo. Uh, maybe they show up and and vote for the gubernatorial candidate and skip the rest of the ballot, right? That, that's, those, are, those kinds of decisions are possible. We're joined by Dave Dulio, director of the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University, as well as a professor of political science at Oakland University. More information on the website, oakland.edu. That's oakland.edu for more information. Also making national headlines in the state of Michigan uh, from our state politics recently, uh, Michigan Senator Mallory McMorrow, who is a Democrat, uh, made national headlines in her rebuttal to being labeled a groomer, being labeled a pedophilia sympathizer by Michigan State Senator Alana Tice, who is also uh, who is a Republican. Uh, did you, what, what were your initial thoughts about Senator McMorrow's response and the political implications that that situation has, particularly because of the the passionate response of Senator McMorrow? How does that then politically impact? both the Republican Party in the state of Michigan, but also the Democratic race, having someone now on a national stage like Senator McMorrow on a topic that's continued to be of discussion in many different political arenas nationally and, and statewide. Well, I think Senator, Senator McMorrow sort of threw down the gauntlet, right? She did, and, and just in, in her terms, right, she'd had enough, and 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 I think that that's that's uh, that's fair, right? Uh, she was criticized, and she shot back. Um, you know that that's sort of what you do in politics, and um, I, I think we've seen a couple results already. One is that, uh, as you mentioned, she got national attention. She she got a phone call from President Biden, um, and she raised a ton of money uh, from it, and and that's. Uh, positive outcomes for her. I think that, you know, in terms of the parties and, and looking ahead to uh, what it means for the for the 22 campaign and for Election Day, right, it, it feeds the base politics uh, mode that we're in, right, where uh, the, the Republicans are going to take uh, away what they want to from it. Democrats are going to take away what they want to from it and and uh, dig in more to, to support their their side. And um, and they're going to uh, do what they can to fire up their base. And, and on both sides, um, this does that. Yeah, I think for the Republicans that in, in the state Senate, particularly uh, Senator Tice, it's sort of a retreat and rethink and then come back on the attack from a different angle, considering they got, frankly, body slammed by Senator McMorrow in response to that. And for the Democrats, it's uh, hit the hit, uh, put the pedal to the metal on uh, in that in that battle and really lean into that. I think that's going to be playing a uh, significant factor going forward, especially as we approach primary season. And for the the Democrats, not only are they focused on, of course, getting their candidates uh, elected and putting their best foot forward, 
but also trying to play as much prevent against the Trump Republican candidates for those key offices, particularly Christina Caramo for Secretary of State and, uh, and the Perno for the Attorney General's position. We're just joined by Dave Dulio from Oakland University. He is a political science professor over there as well as their uh, director for the Center for uh, Civic Engagement. And we want to give you a couple minutes before we say goodbye to talk about upcoming events and, uh, and discussions at the Center for Civic Engagement so people can continue to get politically involved but have important conversations about these critical issues in a form that is open and it's inviting and as you and as it's in the name civil yeah we're uh, we're already looking ahead to next year tyler and, and thinking about ways we can um uh be a convener of conversations uh for issues of public importance not just for oakland county but southeast michigan and and michigan as a whole um, I, we're not quite ready to let the cat out of the bag on something that's going to come up in May, um, but uh, I hope your viewers will will watch out in the next week or so for a, for an announcement. I think that they will find uh, very interesting and uh, engaging, and um, hopefully we can come back and, and talk to you about it. Well, Dave, we appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. Good to talk to you.